Thanks, Alicia, for that and for to Gyan Prabha for having me here uh, today. So I'm going to start off with a few quotes and then uh, actually do the description of the project that I asked Alicia not to do uh, so that we don't repeat ourselves. Um, and so it'll be kind of a, a set up with an abstract kind of conceptual set of questions and then really get down to uh, the research we did towards uh, this exhibition. Um, okay. Um, is this necessary? It just uh, disorients me, I guess. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, true, true, there are revolts against bourgeois ideology. This is what one generally calls the avant garde. But these revolts are socially limited because they remo remain open to salvage. First, because they come from a small section of the bourgeoisie itself, from a minority group of artists and intellectuals without public other than the class which they contest, and who remain dependent on its money in order to express themselves. Then, these revolts always get their inspiration from a very strongly made distinction between the ethically and the politically bourgeois. What the avant-garde contests is the bourgeois in art or morals, but as, far as, uh, but as far as political contestation, there is none. What the avant-garde does not tolerate about the bourgeoisie is its language, not its status. This, this does not necessarily mean that it approves of the status, simply it leaves it aside. Uh, this is from an essay by Roland Barthes, Mid Today, from 1954. So we're already in the second half of the 20th century. The research for our project began uh, kind of counting time because we had to start somewhere uh, from the 1930s. Um, and so this quote is not referring, referring to the early avant-garde, but um, I will at some point also trace back to them. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about this exhibition we did in Berlin at the House of World Cultures called Parapolitics, uh, Cultural Freedom and the Cold War. Uh, it was co-curated with Ansem Franke, Paz Gueva, Antonia Majaka and myself, uh, and we also had a magician, uh, Sia Lehase, who was our produc production manager, who pretty much uh, with the team uh, did a lot of the logistical work to make, you see the scale of the show, to make this happen. Uh, and in this exhibition, we were grappling with um, quite a few concepts, but I'll set up like one thread right now. Uh, the relationship between artistic autonomy, so what does it mean for art to be free? Uh, not to be subject to the uh, dictates of nationalist or cultural propaganda or political ideology. Uh, that's the first category. Second category, modernist abstraction. So a history of abstraction in art as opposed to realism and figuration. Uh, and what the freedom that abstraction kind of claims for itself was the freedom not to rep represent reality as an image or as an identifiable image. Uh, and the third category, um, was the extrajudicial realm of covert state operations, right? State, covert statecraft operations. So let's say secret service operations um, that in the realm of culture, which I'll refer to briefly uh, as the wild zone of power. Um, for the sake of today's pre presentation, I'm going to stay quite close to um, the history of a one secretly funded organization called the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was sponsored by the CIA, covertly sponsored by the CIA for 17 years until it came to be known as a fact that they were, uh, directed by a man named Michael Josselson. Uh, but for those you know, who are kind of also interested in how this history of this organization kind of parallels the history of, uh, history of art through the last century, uh, this debate between abstraction and realism and the way it played out during the Cold War is maybe something to just uh, keep in mind. Manifest in abstract expressionism uh, in America and socialist realism um, in the Soviet Union. Um, and yeah, this debate kind of collapsed a lot of things into these two categories um, and yeah, was in a way like the dominant way in which uh, cultural politics, at least in the field of painting, uh, were being played out. Uh, so now what do I mean by this wild zone of power? Uh, and I'm going to 
rely on another quote by Susan Buck Morse from Dream World and Catastrophe, uh, which was a book that was very important to us, uh, and she sets up this idea. So now I quote, for the perspective of the end of the 20th century, the paradox seems irrefutable that political regimes claiming to rule in the name of the masses, claiming that is to be radically democratic, construct legitimately a terrain in which the exercise of power is out of control of the masses, right? Veiled from public scrutiny, arbitrary and absolute, modern sovereignties harbor a blind spot, a zone in which power is above the law and thus at least potentially a terrain of terror. This wild zone of power by its very structure impossible to domesticate is intrinsic to mass democratic regimes. It makes no difference whether the model of their legitimacy is a liberal to li uh, claim of political, i.e. formal democracy, uh, based on universal mass suffrage, or the socialist claim of economic, i.e. substantive democracy, based on the egalitarianism uh, of distribution of social goods, i.e. communism. Um, either way, as regimes of supreme sovereign power, they are always already more than a democracy, and consequently a good deal less. Um, so for us, this wild zone of power was both actual political power, but also symbolic semantic power. So who gets, who gets to, to decide what freedom looks like, what it means, what it looked like, what its aesthetic kind of uh, aesthetics are. Um, and the conceptual proposition we were kind of trying to think through is whether there's a relationship between the wild zone of power in a kind of state sense uh, and um, you know, with all the kind of subversions and counter subversions and modernist abstraction, which also claims for itself this, you know, freedom to not have to represent reality. Um, so, okay, now um, I'm going to stay with this. I know this is kind of still abstract, but just to um, kind of, because modernism is the big question uh, for us. Uh, or the history of modernism is the big question for us in so far as uh, this is an art exhibition. Uh, one of the things that it is uh, that is said of the Cold War is that it's during that time that modernism with all its kind of radical potential of, uh, you know, critiquing and subverting um, the bourgeoisie or the, you know, or basically uh, economic uh, power uh, was also domesticated. So it started off as a radical, um, the early avant-garde started off as kind of a, with a radical political agenda, but through the course of um, the 20th century became a style, right? Like, and you can think of that in terms of design, for example. Um, so, okay. Um, I'm going to, I'll come back to that. I, okay, so the, uh, and, and just to think, just to keep that question in mind, was uh, modernism domesticated or was, you know, is there something to be kind of salvaged from it regardless of uh, the way it played out? Okay, so the exhibition um, that I'm going to talk to you about, there are three parts of uh, this building uh, that we inhabited, and I'm going to probably focus on the one space that is outside the two exhibition halls, which is this foyer area. Uh, and then we'll see, depending on time, uh, whether we go, uh, you know, uh, go forth. So uh, I'll give this brief introduction. This is kind of what our text was. Uh, and I'll also annotate it as I'm going along. So it is a well-known fact that the US Central Intelligence Agency, basically the CIA, secretly funded culture during the Cold War. Parapolitics is not about revealing that scandal, despite the lack of engagement it has met from museums. The reason we set, we set this up, the reason we said, okay, uh, this is about, I mean, this is not about the fact, because we know this fact, is exactly uh, because we wanted to shift the register, not to focus only on the scandal, but to really think of what its implications are and what its implications are for us until today because it's easy to wrap this up as something that happened in the past. Uh, but in fact, even though the story is and is not known, uh, the structures that were set up by um, the CIA funding of uh, culture potentially remain in other forms with us today. 
right? Um, so pa uh, parrot politics is not about revealing that scandal, despite the lack of engagement it has met from museums. The exhibition project questions whether the canon of Western modernism can really be retroactively globalized without confronting the ideological structures and institutional narrative that supported and exported it. Against this backdrop, the exhibition traces uh, how the struggle for hegemony during the Cold War helped shape the way modern art came to be defined and defended as free, right? So fundamentally individual and beyond ideology. It looks at Cold War constructs of feed freedom and modes in which artistic and cultural autonomy uh, are conceived in the anxious liberal democratic consensus that is uh, current uh, condition. Um, so the way in which we were doing this was we, we were focusing, we were employing, not even focusing, one of the, uh, this history of this one organization that is called the Congress for Cultural Freedom. And the question that we kept actually asking ourselves, because we didn't want to necessarily do a show that was, you know, some kind of historical documentation of uh, the Congress for Cultural Freedom, uh, we kept asking ourselves, is this a show about the Congress for Cultural Freedom or is it, you know, is it not? Uh, and there were many reasons for this and maybe we can come back to that in the Q&A. Um, so we used this front organization and front organizations was actually um, a tool that was developed by the Comintern, so by uh, the Soviet Union's uh, cultural and PR uh, operation, and uh, which is just that you have an intermediary organization that claims to be funding you, but is basically uh, getting money from some source or the other, right? Um, so, and the reason uh, we use this organization, as I think I've been saying, is that to reconsider the political appropriation of aesthetic form through the course of the 20th century. Um, and it's a show that, in a way, casts long, sh like, is about the long shadows that are cast uh, from a momentous shift that happens in intellectual affiliations all the way back um, from the 1930s. So what happens in the 1930s, there are the show trials in Moscow. Stalin is uh, putting a number of artists on trial for not abiding to what is the cultural code of socialist realism. Uh, and this event, this kind of threat to artistic autonomy and intellectual autonomy leads a lot of intellectuals who were uh, not only Marxists but communists uh, to realign their relationship to communism capital C, right? So communism capital C would be communism as it is practiced, I mean, as it is playing out uh, in, uh, in political uh, kind of state, uh, state forms versus small c cam communism would be also uh, like as an ideology or as uh, not only a political theory but a cultural theory, right? So a lot of intellectuals who are pro-Soviet uh, Union uh, decide not only to break away from the Soviet Union but also re-question how they use their um, Marxist training sometimes. And a lot of them continue to remain Marxist but there's a switch that happens from being kind of a political Marxist to a cultural Marxist. So you use Marxism uh, in your cultural theory. Um, right, so there, there were varying, uh, the US, uh, the rise of Stalinism in the USSR led a number of artists and writers to break away to varying degrees from their previous commitments to revolutionary politics. Uh, by the 50s, this group of like once radicals come to be comprised uh, the non-communist left, right? So they're still the left, and this is very crucial. Like after the Second World War, uh, for a brief moment, you couldn't be the right, right? Nobody could be the right. So uh, this group is still left-leaning in a way, uh, and this changes and morphs, uh, but they're just they're non-communist in their, in their affiliations. Uh, and a lot of these people, basically through the Congress for Cultural Freedom and um, you know, if you think through intellectual history, it's surprising to know how pretty much, you know, everyone uh, was somehow connected to the story. Uh, but so a lot of these um, intellectuals found themselves enrolled, whether they knew it or not, uh, in a US-led freedom offensive. 
right? So uh, often under the umbrella of the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Okay, are we, are you with me? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so what our exhibition did was, I think we were working at, at least on three tracks in terms of material. Right? So we were, uh, of course, displaying the work of contemporary artists who engage with um, the struggle for cultural hegemony. And somehow we were committed to practices that uh, break through um, the reductive closures of these two binaries of abstraction and realism. Right? Because in a way, um, this was also our position, that these were constructed dichotomies. You could also say that abstraction is a kind of realism in the sense of it, um, it represents you know, a certain alienation, for example. Um, so next to these, so that was the first category of uh, contemporary artworks. The next was works that were archival material, right? So one of the things that the Congress for Cultural, and I'm gonna now get into the history of the Congress for Cultural Freedom, but they, uh, they produced a lot of cultural, um, yeah, there was a lot of cultural production that happened in their name. Um, they had offices in 35 countries. Uh, they support, either founded or supported something like 50 uh, magazines around the world uh, and, you know, hundreds of conferences uh, and also art exhibitions. Their main role wasn't um, was an exhibition making uh, because MoMA was doing that, uh, but they were also, they did some very crucial exhibitions as well. Um, so, yeah, exactly. Next to these artworks are CCF material, and the focus on the CCF, I mean, there's so much stuff, right? So, the focus, the, what guided us in terms of what we displayed or what we tried to set up was. Uh, through these publications that were associated with the CCF, uh, was to kind of make explicit how intellectuals and artists became a strategic target. Right? They were the target, uh, and modernism was the weapon. Right? And, uh, and in this kind of rapidly developing arsenal of peaceful uh, techniques to win uh, the Cold War. Um, and, and then the third category was historical artworks. So artworks that were negotiating these questions at the time. So these also dated from the early 30s uh, onwards, right? So um, because, I mean, a lot of this bad, for example, with the CCF, we didn't actually have um, a work by Picasso, but this debate um, or the struggle that the CCF was uh, involved in at some point after the the news broke that the CIA had been funding them. Uh, you know, one of there are a couple of like sentences uh, that really stuck out from the literature around the disclosure. Uh, disclosure, and one of them was that if you have to understand this battle, uh, this Cold War battle, or what the CCF was trying to do, uh, you have to understand it as a battle for Picasso's mind, right? Like Picasso was a communist since the 1950s, quite late to decide to become a communist, given what was happening, remains a communist till he dies, right? Uh, and, but he's also the epitome of a modern artist, right? Of modernism, somehow. So, um, so this was the struggle. And we'll kind of, this will become slightly clearer as we go. Um, so, and we weren't showing works to say, oh, look, this was funded by the CIA. This really wasn't the, uh, you know, the task, but really to see how did artists negotiate um, the pressures that they knew and didn't know, right? Because it, did, it wasn't about, even at the time, our, our senses, it wasn't about the fact that you knew this was funded by the CIA or not. Uh, there were also, it was also a public secret. You may not know it was the CIA, you knew it was American money, etc. cetera. Um, so, uh, so rather than works that were produced under the, patronage of the CIA. Uh, we wanted to show how the political use of art, both overt and covert, forced artists to renegotiate the framing and meaning of their work. They also shifted, right? They also made decisions based on how they understood the context they were operating in. Uh, and, you know, some, somehow this seems also so far away because it doesn't seem to be necessarily always uh, the concern in our current uh, context, but the question of you know, autonomy in the political sense was somehow uh, fundamental. 
And so these artworks for us, they wrote their own stories of evasion, uh, subversion, and critique. Uh, and the last thing was that, and this is kind of, you know, the show has the word, I mean, the term Cold War in it. But for, for the year and a half that we were doing research, we really stayed, tried very hard to stay away from that term. Right? We, we didn't, we, we were looking at a longer history. We started in the 1930s, and we wanted to somehow try to stay out of this binary division and see what else uh, we could find. Uh, I won't subject you to the titles we had in mind, but uh, the PR department came back with, you've got to use Cold War in your title, and it probably did as well. It probably did as well, but it's really crazy. As soon as it got named, the Cold, I mean, the show about the Cold War, I'm not sure how to go back to talking about it, um, you know, uh, as we were before. So that's also, it, it's kind of what happened. So, and I hope was between this interplay between artworks and archival material, exactly, one thing that we wanted to do was recover um, what we were calling the conflict lines that animated artistic choices uh, and that continue to haunt the field of contemporary art. And this question of conflict line is exactly this, like, you know, with the 30s, um, you know, with this reorient, reorganizing of one's uh, politics, like, you might be, as I was saying, you might be an intellectual who's a Marxist, um, but you're against the Soviet Union for reasons that have maybe very little to do with the fact that the country that you are in, say the United States, is also against the Soviet Union. But these things collapse. There was no distinction possible uh, to make, I mean, to easily possible to make between these two categories of, uh, of an you know, anti-Soviet uh, position. Okay, I stayed on this forever. This is just, uh, these are the artists we had in the show. Um, so there were quite a lot, and this is just the artworks. This is not stuff that was in vitrines, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, it was a range of, in terms of names we know and names we uh, don't know. And we also went a lot by our gut. It was, it, it, was, it just so happened that uh, a lot of, kind of African-American artists that were working at the time um, that we weren't so familiar with, but came to become familiar with during the research of our show, uh, were also then showing at uh, the Black Power show that happened at Tate at the same, uh, around the same time. So it, it, there's also this sense of somehow this history, you know, emerging right now for various reasons. Um, okay, so, <laughs> this is a quote from the opening of uh, a book that was, I mean, that's kind of the go-to uh, history about the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Uh, the book is called, you'll see it later, the book is called uh, Who Paid the Piper? Um, and it's, it's really about the cultural Cold War. Uh, she, I think she wrote it, uh, her name is Frances Stoner, Ston, uh, Stoner Saunders. She's a journalist by profession. And so she wraps a fascinating tale. Uh, ever since then, a lot of academic work has, especially now, a lot of academic work is being done on the Congress for Cultural Freedom, and they're always critiquing her for her errors, or you know. But it's still the she's still the best storyteller on this, uh, you know, on the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Um, so. I'm going to now just tell you a bit more about the Congress for Cultural Freedom, right? So as we know, during the height of the Cold War, the um, U.S. government committed an immense amount of resources uh, towards a secret uh, program of cultural propaganda, exactly as in the quote, you should not even know that it's propaganda, uh, in West, not just in Western Europe, but in fact uh, around the world. In, Again, the dominant literature seems to think 50s, they focused on Western Europe, and then the 60s, they went to other places like um, you know, Africa, Middle East, etc. The Congress for Cultural Freedom was in Bombay in 1951, right? So their office still exists in the Army and Navy building at the top floor. Uh, my mom went to it once. <laughs> um, and uh, the Quest was the magazine that came out of there. I'll get because we're here, I'll get more into the Indian 
committee for cultural freedom because uh, I mean each committee was its own uh, you know own can of worms in a way um, and and Quest continued even after the disclosed Quest was the magazine that they were find, uh, funding here um, one of two okay so uh, as I said one of the main features of this cultural uh, program was to pretend as if it did not exist. Uh, and so it was managed in great secrecy uh, through extensions of the CIA. Uh, and lit, like the, the CIA funded a lot of things. It funded also labor unions. It also funded uh, revolutionary movements you know, uh, against dictatorships. Uh, and in the cultural field, the Congress for Cultural Freedom uh, was by far you know, kind of the biggest, uh, the big, it had the biggest budget. And it was run by this man, uh, uh, Michael Josselson, who was an Estonian refugee to America, was part of the psychological warfare division during um, um, the Second World War. Uh, but you have to, but the intention really was to promote cultural autonomy, right? Uh, and the achievements of this organization, not to say, nothing to say about its uh, duration, are huge, right? It, as I said, had 35 offices around the world, employed, um, you know, do dozens of people, published over 20 prestigious magazines, held art exhibitions, owned a news and service, uh, feature service, and uh, organized high-profile international conferences, exhibition, prizes, music events, um, you know, uh, and in, yeah, in many countries. Uh, and its main, if we had to understand what did it want to do, right? Its main aim was to kind of somehow, as uh, Saunders puts it, nudge the intelligentsia uh, of, I would say, not just Western Europe, but the world, away from any remaining fascination uh, with Marxism uh, and communism uh, towards a view more accommodating of the American way, right? Uh, it worked through a network of, as I said, people who were working in divisions like the uh, Psychological Warfare Division, but also with a network of Ivy League uh, CIA employees, right? So it's, it's, it's a really uh, tight world of intellectuals who you know, also had good reason to do what they were doing. At that time, the CIA wasn't what the CIA would become, right? It, 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 in many ways, it always was, but there were also parts of the CIA that were, in, in fact, committed to um, intellectual work. So, and this is where it gets tricky, right? Like, uh, from where you see what the CIA is. And, um, okay, so... <clears throat> The, the, so the main question that comes up, right, like what is, what is this matter? Does it matter where we are getting our funding from, especially if um, they're not really telling you what to do, right? They, the CCF knew that if they really were interested in working with uh, left, potentially le liberal individuals, as soon as those people, those intellectuals uh, could smell the money, they wouldn't want it. Right? So there were many reasons as to why this operation was covert, and one of them was, uh, and, and they worked with the conviction that if you are a liberal thinking individual and you did what you wanted to do, it would serve us. Right? So there was this, uh, this was at least the conviction, I mean, this was one of the ways in which uh, we've encountered this problem. That um, So... And, and so the question that uh, someone like Saunders sets up and others have complicated, refuted, uh, tried to think of agency differently, like does, just because of the funding, does it mean uh, everything is, you know, um, somehow tainted by it? And we'll see in different political and geographical contexts, this money meant different things, right? In, I have the quote later, but in the head of the CCF uh, Africa division, he, you know, he says, if we knew the money was coming from the CIA, we would have asked for more, 
right? <laughs> uh, like, there's nothing we would have done differently, and uh, you know, there's nothing that they made us do. Uh, in Lebanon, when the news broke out, one of the writers uh, of uh, the magazines, I'm getting ahead of myself, I'm gonna come to this, but it's fine. Um, you know, he said, who's the fool actually? Is it the CIA who funded a Marxist magazine or the Marxists who, you know, ended up writing? So it really was, in, in some cases, a completely uh, unclear what this uh, funding could have meant. But uh, to come back to Saunders, like her, um, she, she's reading a lot of the archives, uh, and what she finds is, uh, is exactly that quote, right? Like, the, a, a successful operation is when the subjects move, like this is a quote, when the subject moves in the direction you desire for reasons which he believes is his own. Right, are to be his own. So this is where the minefield gets kind of like quite, uh, uh, quite difficult to right navigate. Uh, and and she says, and so what does that mean for autonomy? Right, you might be doing exactly what you want to do, and and if you are inadvertently still serving the foreign service agency of another country, uh, you know what does that mean for organic intellectual growth? Right? So this is the question that she, uh, she sets up. Um, so yeah, it's a kind of a freedom, she says, where people think they are acting freely when in fact they are bound to forces over which they have no control. Right? OK. So I think I'm, you have, I think I'm going to potentially go on for very long. So you can just at some point just stop me. OK, um, because I realize I'm at slide six. Um, so the Congress for Cultural Freedom, it, it opened in Berlin in 1951 with a conference. Uh, something like uh, in June 1950. Uh, and the, as, as we've been saying, it was a way in which um, writers and intellectuals came together and consolidated an anti-totalitarian intellectual community, right? What happens after the Cold War for those uh, who, I mean, there's an equation between Nazi Germany and uh, communist uh, and Stalinism, right? So uh, Nazism, Nazism of the past, you know, uh, gets equated to, uh, to communism. So uh, they become the bad guys again. They've already been that before. Um, so, and for us, what was also kind of uh, maybe there was a lot of meaning in doing this show in Berlin, not only because it was founded there, but the 10-year the anniversary in 1950, which was a huge affair, um, happened at the House of World Cultures, right? which was uh, um, called the Congress Hall before. So there was also, and you know, the House of World Cultures is also a government-funded uh, cultural institution, and so there were questions that kind of became relevant uh, to us uh, now. Um, as I said, the 35 offices kind of span from Latin America to uh, Southeast Asia, um, and yeah, I, and the main overall, not agenda, but uh, what they were kind of promoting or advancing, let's say, uh, in, the, in the magazines and the exhibitions, et cetera, was a universal language of modernism in art, music, literature. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of uh, the reason that this event actually happened. There, there were a lot of energies probably already in play, and then so, that somehow got consolidated. And one of the kind of events that uh, triggered this event was a peace conference um, that happened in New York in 1949 uh, at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, where a number of uh, intellectuals uh, came together in support for peace. So this is the division that happens. There's the Soviet Union goes away with peace and the US goes away with freedom. Right, so you have Picasso's peace dove, uh, and so it's, a, and that's what I mean by it's a semantic battle. It's about what, 
who gets which word and what you make it mean, right? Um, so uh, this conference happens right after just one day. It's on the 26th of June, so right after North Korea invades South Korea. Uh, it's inaugurated by the mayor. Uh, there are 4,000 people in the audience. Um, and you know they set up what we were calling, and I'm sure it's somebody else was doing it, which is why we did it, what is uh, the freedom discourse, right? So uh, the notion of freedom um, was addressed from between this east-west uh, paradigm. And there were conference panels, science and totalitarianism, freedom and the artists, citizens in free society, uh, and defense of peace and freedom. Um, now, what happened at the conference, I mean, the event in New York was that uh, a number of intellectuals who came to be called the New York intellectuals were uh, somehow retaliated to um, what was a Soviet, also a Soviet propaganda uh, from you know, their point of view. Uh, and the questions that were asked, this is by uh, a writer called Mary McCarthy, um, was what forces threaten cultural freedom in the US today? She, uh, what constitutes cultural freedom? So you, you see the kind of production now of this discourse around, uh, around cultural freedom. Uh, that, that is pitted against um, the experience of artists and intellectuals and musicians um, in, in, in under uh, Stalinist uh, regime. Um, so at the end, this is Arthur, Arthur Kostler. I don't know if uh, any of you uh, know his work. Um, He's a writer. Um, so he proclaimed you know, in front of this huge audience that intellectuals of the West have left their defensive positions. Freedom has seized the offensive. He draft, they drafted a uh, manifesto after this conference. And in that manifesto, uh, they claimed intellectual freedom as a human right uh, and deprived of the right to say no. Uh, this is the quote, deprived of the right to say no, man becomes a slave. Uh, and the question for us was like, as, they are, as there's this promotion of freedom or this freedom discourse, um, and most of these people, I mean, it's not that all of these people are American. A lot of them are European, Eastern European. Um, so, you know, while this is, this is happening um, in Europe, uh, you know, with a, with a check from the CIA, while there is segregation in America. Right, so there's a there's a kind of conflict of uh, a, a contradiction in how this discourse is playing out uh, historically. So, um, okay, I won't get into. There's so many names, so I'm going to try and stay away from the names. Uh, and there's this uh, German language magazine called Der Monat that actually started before uh, the CCF was founded, but very much became a part of the CCF, uh, edited by uh, a, nam, um, a man very kind of crucial to the CCF story called Melvin Lasky. And so the event was sponsored by, um, I mean, for all eff eff events, and effects and purposes by Der Monat. Um, this is just, you can, so, you know, this is stuff that came to surface later. Uh, but the point being that um, by 1967, through a series of uh, newspaper articles, in 1966 in a magazine called Ramparts, and in 1967 in the New York Times, uh, it comes to be revealed that there's this amount of, uh, these amount of activities, not just the CCF, but a range of activities that are being funded uh, by the bankrolled by the CIA, and um, and that's when the scandal erupts, right? Like that's when a scandal erupts. A number of editors resign. Um, you know, um, magazines fold. Some manage to exist continuously, and the suspicion that had always been there around the CCF, in a way that it wasn't an autonomous entity, gains its validity. Um, what? The CCF's reputation is completely destroyed, right? I mean, we don't even know about them, right? So, I mean, 
uh, because what ends up getting exposed are these ideological contradictions. What does it mean to be an intellectual um, who does or doesn't know that they're being funded by uh, the CIA? And it also, the other thing that is uh, exposed is this kind of, the moral ambiguities of advocating freedom, and, and this is the main thing. It's not like, oh, you're, uh, you know, you're involved in some kind of um, political agenda. You're advocating for freedom uh, in a, in, through means that are not transparent, and that's the fundamental contradiction uh, that, uh, and for means that are outside any kind of accountability, democratic accountability, uh, and that's the reason um, the scandal erupts and is as big as it is. Uh, and I want to just think about, the, I mean, want to just pause on the fact that I think it's unclear why, even though the scandal was so big at the moment, at that time, it has kind of waxed and waned in its presence in kind of intellectual or cultural life. There's a lot more attention on it now, and there has been in crucial moments, but it isn't as... It's not GK, right? It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not kind of somehow uh, in some parts of the world common knowledge. In America, my sense in the U.S. is that it is, but it's completely normalized, right? Like I don't think anyone's surprised when they say, "Oh, you know, MoMA and the CIA were involved with each other." It's. It's. Um, it's. Yeah. But somehow it's the way it is. So <laughs> um, now. Uh, what I'm gonna, how, how am I doing for, oh my God. Okay, is everyone okay? <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> okay, so what I'm gonna, like now it's, it, um, that's the setup. I'm gonna move sometimes between artworks uh, and kind of share a few, we worked, through this research project, I mean, through the research phase, we worked with a, obviously a number of con con concepts, but also uh, certain figures, right? We had like archetype figures that we were thinking through to kind of understand the different players that were, um, yeah, operating. Uh, and some of these were visible in the exhibition. Um, some of them uh, were even visible in the text. There, there was a lot of text in the exhibition as well, and that was the kind of invitation to move between these stories and these works, and they each do their own thing. Um, and in some cases, they were concepts that guided us, but weren't spelt out. But they determined how we, uh, we were thinking or navigating through work. So as we've already started talking about this kind of question of the freedom discourse, um, this was a series of works, uh, paintings, made uh, by obviously not an abstract painter, <laughs> but uh, he was actually an, uh, he, he, he did a lot of illustrations uh, for newspapers. His name is Norman Rockwell, and he, and, and this is the contradiction. One of, I should mention this, one of the reasons why the funding for modern art initially was a covert, uh, one of the reasons, uh, not the only, uh, w w you know, was a covert project was because the government of America, the U.S. Congress, uh, in the 30s at least, didn't want to support modern art. Right? They're like, this is a waste of taxpayer money. And they took shows off the road. Right? So there was a moment, I mean, there's also these splits kind of internally in terms of um, government and intellectuals. Right? So one of the reasons for an, uh, modern art to have been uh, also private funded, right? like with, through the MoMA, et cetera, um, was because there was, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't that, yeah, Truman didn't think so. Like, Truman didn't think this was worth, uh, you know, worth the buck. So, um, so these were commissioned during the Second World War, right? Uh, they were inspired by a speech by uh, Roosevelt to actually, because during the interwar years, so after the First World War and the Depression, America was, had, I think had some, um, I'm not, I don't, I mean, legal, like whatever, decisions not to spend money on war. Uh, Roosevelt gives a speech um, in 1943, uh, or, or earlier a bit, uh, to convince 
I mean, to convince basically Ameri American citizens that this is what we're fighting for. We need to put money into the second into the war because we need to defend our our freedom, right? So uh, these were printed alongside essays uh, over four consecutive uh, weeks in 1943. Um, by the Saturday Evening Post, which was extremely wide read in so far as uh, white America. Um, and these essays were very influential. So freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear, uh, inspired by Roosevelt's 1941 State of Union address, and later became the centerpiece of a traveling war bond sales campaign that raised over $130 million. So this is not high art. MoMA probably doesn't want anything to do with it, but it's on the road and it's making money for the war, right? Um, then, so yeah, the Neutrality Acts in 1930, were, which were passed by the US Congress during the Great Depression, were meant to limit the country's investment uh, in future conflicts, but FDR's For Freedom speech uh, marked a fundamental break from that. So now we can go to war for freedom, uh, is, is what happens, right? Uh, and prevail, and it's prevailing till this day, as we know, uh, from the tradition of non-interventionism that preceded it. Devel uh, delivered 11 months before the United States declared war on Japan, the speech projected an image of hope into a post-war war world and reminded the country that it would be what it would be fighting for, uh, a worldwide extension of the American ideal of individual liberties, right? So this is, this, these four works played, uh, played a part in that, in that story. Uh, now, who's Rockwell, right? So he's a, uh, his style is of small-time realism, right? He, he, there's, I mean, I actually find him, come to find him really interesting, but he was completely out of step with the oncoming wave of modernist abstraction, uh, whose advocates were mis... Um, you know, hysterically hostile to popular culture uh, and uh, tended to equate commercial art serving state propaganda with fascism proper, right? So there's all these kind of twists and turns happening, you know, just within the radius of one single work. Um, so he snubbed, I mean, you should look him up online to see what I mean by snubbed for his sentimentality uh, and accused for fant. Uh, fantasizing an America that never was. Rockwell was nonetheless hugely consequential. The Post was one of the most widely circulated magazines among the white middle class, and the artist illustrator produced 332 covers over the course of his career. By the end of the war, four million uh, Four Freedom posters were printed. By the end of this century, last century, 25 million prints have been sold. So. Okay, so this is the freedom discourse that, um, you know, that, that, that the CCF is somehow an extension of. And I'm not going to play this video, but it is online. Uh, it's a video called Free White in 21 <laughs> by Howardina Pindel, who's an African-American, really prominent uh, and important um, artist. And this was our, uh, this, I mean, this is kind of how we were working, right? So these two works were juxtaposed next to each other. You got kind of uh, something, and then you got uh, kind of uh, tongue-in-cheek something else, right? And, and she's basically thinking through what it means to be uh, free, white, and 21, and how to become free, white, and 21 in her, in her piece. And so uh, uh, this is, kind of, I mean, it's, a, it's kind of absurd, it's, it's quite funny. Um, and the main kind of conceptual frame that I'm kind of pointing to, I'm not running you through all the works in this section. There were a lot of works by um, not just African-American artists, but also um, works around the African-American condition, uh, also music. Um, and so the concept that we were working with here is exactly, okay, th about this contradiction, we were using the term foreclosure, right, which is a Lacanian term, and uh, it was, it came, I mean, it came to us or came into our language through a very, a text that was very important for, um, for our, project which was called Escaping Liberty, 
Uh, it's a text by Bana Hess, who, is, uh, who teaches at Northwestern. And he, um, I'm going to just give you a brief sense of the text because of, you know, because it's, it was important to how we were thinking. What he, he's focused, the text is a, you know, philosophical, uh, is, a, is a work of political philosophy. And uh, he was looking at Isaiah Berlin's two concepts of liberty, which is a, you know, kind of very uh, important text in terms of the Western philosophical tradition uh, around notions of freedom uh, and liberty. And um, he was trying to think about, about these two concepts of liberty and this text and what implications it has for uh, what he was calling or what is called black fugitive thought, right? And um, focusing on writers like Césaire, Du Bois, and David Walker. And his main claim, what his main argument is, is that the trope of liberty in Western liberal political theory, uh, which connects Isaiah Berlin to people like John Stuart Mill uh, and Benjamin Constant has maintained a universal meaning and coherence by excluding and silencing any representation of its modernity, affiliations, and entanglement with Atlantic slavery uh, and the European empires. So you could only develop a, a theory, a philosophical, um, you know, in the Western philosophical tradition, uh, you could only kind of continue to think about the notion of freedom for all humanity uh, if you somehow foreclosed or didn't bring to surface uh, what he was calling the racial, basically racism and colonialism, right? The history of uh, slavery and the history of colonization. Um, and so this particular, and so it's racial colonial foreclosure is how he, he terms it. So this particular incarnation of theories, uh, he says, is characterized as the Western discursive and hegemonic effects of racial colonial foreclosure. And foreclosure describes the discursive context in which particular terms or references become impossible to formulate. So there's a certain unspeakability uh, that kind of is, has to be maintained in order for that theory to operate, right? Or to, um, and I won't, okay. And, and the bottom line is that if we, cons if we agree with that, if we agree that in order for, uh, um, you know, one to follow in the Western liberal tradition um, around notions of freedom, um, what is the option for black fugitive thought? And his, and his proposition, which he takes us through, is that black fugitive thought, or the black radical tradition, as it's known, would have to escape the notion of liberty itself, as it has been formulated. So um, this was something that was basically quite important for us as we, um, yeah, as we went on. That's Philip Guston. This is Romare Bearden. Uh, this is, again, I mean, Philip Guston was an, also an abstract expressionist. He's the only one who comes back to a kind of figuration. And he's, and for that reason, supremely interesting to think through. It's very different, the figuration that he does before and after his abstract expressionist period. Uh, but, you know, and as the Ku Klux Klan, no less, right? So that work is actually called uh, the studio. So he's really thinking about the role of the artist, um, in, in white hegemony, right? And this one by Romer Bearden is from 1968, and it's um, the, the artist in, sorry, I should know that, the black American in search of his identity. But it's also obviously a question for, um, you know, for him as an art, African American artist, especially at that moment uh, after the civil uh, rights movement has succeeded in certain regards, and there's a kind of opening, right, to define who, you, who you're going to be somehow. Uh, so there's, you know, the mask of an ancient, not so ancient, also uh, African past, and there's a, he was working a lot with collage, and uh, so there's, so they're, they're probably very important uh, news images in there, um, and yeah, and he's, you know, 
I think he's great. Okay, so that was one concept. This is just two minutes, and it's funny. So I think I think it's funny. Uh, so the, this is the second. Uh, the second. Uh, this is uh, sorry. This is one of the figures we are working with. I mean, I'll speak about it afterwards. Sorry, I should say that this was a. Uh, I'm not sure about this clip, but. Um, the Moiseyev dance company was a dance company from the Soviet Union. This is in the late 50s when kind of a cultural exchange situation has started to happen. It premiered in uh, the M Metropolitan Opera in New York. Uh, and the reason we were taken, we came to it was through a book called dance, uh, Don't Act, Just Dance, uh, which opens with a real fascinating um, account of a poem that was written in the New Yorker about this one single uh, piece. They did many pieces that were very different, I think. And for us, it really kind of, um, I'm going to say that later. <laughs> Sorry about the white <laughs> Sorry. frame. It's okay about the sound. Boys, even in Russia here, two of them starting a big fight. Exactly. So I'm just going to read a quote from this book uh, called Don't Act, Just Dance. It's going to make sense. I'm not just like entertaining, <laughs> trying to entertain you. Not, not so many people seem to have found it funny. But regardless of that, so I'm, gonna, so I'm quoting from Catherine Kodat's book, uh, Don't Act, uh, Just Dance. Um, and was, okay, so what appears to be two small figures uh, clenched together and uh, swathed in fur-trimmed Arctic native garb, wrestle back and forth across the stage. The dance proceeds. Um, sorry, I have to bring my mouse back here. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Uh, what, yeah. The dance proceeds through a comic series of leg holes and falls, including a bit of apparent wall walking and a moment of literal brinkmanship at the edge of the orchestra pit before its conclusion when the costume pops open to show that the two identically dressed battlers are in fact just one person. Right? The slapstick context between adversaries so perfectly matched as to be seemingly twins is then only half of the joke. With the trick of the dance revealed, viewers realize that the joke has been on them. 
the register of their enjoyment shifts from laughter uh, at the farcical antics of two boys in a fight to wonder at the skill of the single dancer who is so able, uh, so ably carried off the deception. Okay. Uh, what she's trying to set up for us here, and this is something um, why we did focus a lot purely on the CIA operation. Uh, it was important for us to know through and through that as many um, scholars have uh, emphasized, like David Cott and uh, on, on, Odd on Westart, that uh, the Cold War came about in no small degree thanks to not the differences between the Soviet Union and America, but in fact that they were just the same thing. Right? So the acres of shared political, cultural, and ideological common ground shared between the Soviet Union uh, and the United States. Um, so uh, yeah, so basically what you know, this idea of an exceptionalism on either side was what she was uh, trying to kind of what she's alerting uh, us against. So and this was true of writers who might have very different positions about the Cold War, but they um, you know, but they kind of, it was only possible, uh, the Cold War was only possible because both sides agreed on cultural values to an extent that may seem astonishing, given the huge divide between quote unquote totalitarian system and a pluralistic democracy. Um, so, in, yeah, and I think, yeah, so I think I'll just, on that note, just, um, I could go on for, like, I'm on slide 13 out of 50, so that's okay. <laughs> but uh, I just, huh? Maybe more yeah, uh, for sure. Uh, but I, I just want, I'll just tie this in uh, to, to the fact that, okay, so historically, um, the point that she's, that she's making and that kind of helped us think through uh, a number of things was that, whether it was during the, not even just during the Cold War, even before the Cold War, in the 1930s, America uh, has a program called the uh, Workers' uh, Progress Association, WPA, where a lot of artists were involved in um, community activities. So art, you know, uh, that like in places like Harlem or uh, where, where the aim of that project, if, if there was an aim behind that funding, the aim was to turn everyone into an artist. Not everyone, but you know, whoever it is that is your audience. So mural making, uh, you know, workshops, etc. Uh, and a lot of the African, I mean, a lot of the African American artists that were in our show were also part of this WPA uh, uh, moment. What happens after the Second World War? especially with the advent, uh, advent of the Museum of Modern Art, who kind of comes onto the stage and is a major player in the background and the foreground of the art history sections of our show, uh, the shift goes from trying to turn everyone into an uh, artist to trying to turn everyone into a viewer, a viewer of, an, of art. So producing uh, the, the production of the viewer and what it meant to view, like how you became modern by uh, viewing modern art, right? Uh, and the museum shop becomes a thing, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the, the shift is from, in, in America, between the 30s and the 50s, uh, is this. Uh, but in both these situations, you still have a use for art, right? There's still a potential instrumentalization of art. And this is then what the US shares with uh, the Soviet Union and its more overt cultural propaganda. Uh, and after 89, a lot of, there are a lot of cutbacks in um, American art funding because the job is done, right? So uh, this question of art, you know, the use value of art or art being a tool uh, or an instrument, uh, yeah, was something that, that they shared. Not to say that artists didn't subvert or uh, subvert this. No, no, I don't mean to end on this on this note. But uh, I mean, I can just I'll just. So these were kind of books that were really important at the time, not to us. And so yeah, these were like the twenty odd magazines. Uh, I started color coding, but I stopped. Basically, some were 
actually Congress magazines. Others were founded by the Congress, uh, but not, uh, so by Congress I mean CCF, uh, were not CCF, uh, not exclaimed as CCF magazines. And then there were yet others that were, that started off independently, uh, but were very quickly, um, very quickly kind of uh, receiving most of their funding from the CCF. And there were others on this list that may have been funded just once, right? So Paris Review was barely funded, but it took a lot, it took a hit for it, nevertheless. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, and then there were artists that kind of worked. Uh, this is Ink. So he actually, uh, all the black <laughs> on each of those pages is made by his hand. So it was a much longer, this is half the wall, it's a much longer wall, and it was a way to kind of tell uh, cultural political history through the covers of CCF magazines. Uh, and then uh, this work is, I'm not going to speak about it, but I was just also trying to bring together certain aesthetic affinities. This is about Ad Reinhardt. Anyway, um, I guess I will stop. <laughs> I, I just want to show you the, so we had a work by Sousa, which I can tell you about in the, it's called uh, Six Gentlemen of Our Times. He did have an, uh, his essay, Nirvana of a Maggot, uh, appears in Encounter, which is a CCF magazine, through his friendship with the editor, uh, Stephen Spender, who introduces him to Victor Musgrave, which is how he starts to have his solo exhibitions in, um, in London. So this is not to say Sousa knew at all or any of, of such a thing, but just to say how wide the network is and how, uh, you know, it's, yeah. Uh, this is 1951 in Bombay, right? So they, they were here. Uh, India was a major, uh, like, the archives in Chicago were the, where all the, like, paperwork and letters and everything, uh, Chicago University has them. The number of boxes that are correspondence with India is huge. Uh, also because India, they, they gave them, a, they, I think they gave the Secretariat in Paris a lot of trouble because they just wanted to use it. Like it was Jay Prakash Narayan, Meenu Masani, uh, and they were playing their kind of local politics with uh, this kind of, so there's a, so this is just like certain Congress news with, uh, and, and the reason the event happens in 1951 happens in Bombay rather than Delhi is because Nehru is like, I'm neutral, I don't want to touch it. But it's quite interesting by, I think it's 60, 58 or something, or even later, where of course they're still on this kind of, you know, wanting to, <laughs> to uh, win him over. Uh, Quest is the magazine that Nissim is like, well, um, edits for the first 16 issues. I just have his first 16, but the magazine goes on to uh, much later. Anyway, that's the, and I thought this was funny, but anyway, that was an artwork in our show. <laughs> okay. Yeah, hi. The dilemmas of the same old dilemmas. Old ones, yes. <laughs> um, so my, so I don't know exactly how to ask this, but um, maybe as a as your own reflection. When uh, when we look at some kind of correlation between, say, uh, a an approach to art, art practice, yeah. say abstraction in this case, and some you know second, third order funding or patronage for it. How, how do you, uh, how did you navigate the fact that, say, abstraction you know, probably has a much longer, different history? Yeah. Uh, and it is that history is entwined with history of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Because abstraction in the sciences, in knowledge, Absolutely is not entirely from a different planet. Yeah. So how does one uh, really grapple with this question in, in thinking about this, uh, this correlation? Because yeah. I, it's very, what is really, I think the, the uh, startle value, I won't say shock value, the startle value here is really this, this connection between 
particular agenda and the instrumentalization yeah. and uh, the abstractness of, an, of art. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I guess I'll, so it's the tough, it's the core question, right? It's the, it's kind of what's the, the heart of this uh, in a way. And I, I mean, I know where I stand now, but it took a long time. <laughs> and I think exactly, it's about moving past the starter aspect because that's kind of the, the easy answer that um, the short history of the last, because you have various versions in terms of when that last century begins and ends, for example. And uh, if we stay with the Cold War, we, you know, we stay post-war, uh, the scandal does dominate, uh, and and also um, it's good to be on this on this page because uh, you know this is in this comes out in 80, the eighties I guess, and it's the first real work that is tracing the advent of abstract expressionism, uh, how the center of uh, modern art moves from Paris to New York, not just because. Americans are better, but you know all of these things, uh, and you know it's a, it's a, it's kind of coming from a Marxist perspective, but also trying to um, not just recon uh, reconstruct the debates. Uh, one you know with with Shapiro and Barr, the main Alfred Barr and Mayor Shapiro, that's the main contention, right? The main contention is is there something inherently um, uh, more radical in the form of abstract expressionism or, you know, uh, or kind of where does this come from? Um, the longer history of abstraction that you are, and its relation to kind of other modes of, uh, of knowledge is exactly the recovery process that the show was kind of invested in. Uh, I mean, I didn't do the long introduction because I, I wasn't sure where people uh, were in the beginning. Um, I would say modernism was domesticated during the Cold War, uh, but there were elements of uh, this longer history of abstraction that you're referring to that were potentially never actually fully processed, right? And the text I'm working on for uh, the publication, part of it, uh, I mean, it, it's related to a work by Sheila Gada, but part of it traces what happens to Malevich, to the Black Square, right, through the 20th, through the early 20th century. Uh, the Black Square is seen as kind of the one of the founding works of modernist abstraction. I don't know. I don't want to get into telling us uh, all what everything about it, but. Um, that work arrives in Berlin in 1927, along with the show uh, that that Malevich, he's you know he's coming from uh, Russia. Uh, those there's 70 works that get left behind. They get in, they go into storage uh, because the Nazis are also against modern work. Uh, he goes back, gets imprisoned, dies later. Uh, the works. 30 of them end up crossing the Atlantic in the, in the 30s itself and become the basis for Alfred Barr's distinction between what he calls uh, pure abstraction and near abstraction, right? Uh, but there isn't the, the art historical work that is happening till date or is happening now is that there wasn't a real understanding of what Malevich did <coughs> when he arrived into the canon, right? It, and as soon as he dies in 35, his works are not seen for decades in Russia as well. So there, and his writings don't make their way across. So there's an entry of this work into the canon as a foundational stone of the, of the canon, but we, we may not have known what it was exactly or what it was doing. So despite its influence on American artists, despite the fact that every other artist has made a black square, uh, you know, what the black square was in its time and place may not have fully reached us even yet. I hope that answers your question. Uh, so, yeah. 
that, I mean, I guess that's the, that's the work. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, I thought you had. <sighs> I had a question, Nita. Hmm? Uh, one of the things you said uh, in the early part of the lecture was yeah. how this is a, the, this history of the Congress of Cultural Freedom is something that kind of waxes and wanes depending on, yeah. um, I mean, what's happening politically. And one of the reasons why, when I was looking um, at some of the early material that you were showing, uh, I was just thinking about this has become so much, not re directly related to the Congress of Cultural Freedom, but the idea of um, funding behind forms of cultural propaganda. And even yeah. what counts as cultural propaganda has become such a difficult and kind of all pervasive part of the conversation around all forms of art and culture today. I mean, not just who is behind what form of work in the market, but also where is, who is, yeah. who is forming this uh, visually for us, like the aesthetic and the aesthetics of, of everything, particularly because of us being in the digital age. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, in that sense, it seems obviously like a very timely show because it shows us a certain history of when these questions Absolutely. first became important. But in that sense, I was wondering what were some of the responses you got um, to the show from the, the audience uh, in Berlin with regards to this more contemporary relevance yeah. of, you know, what it, the, the aesthetics of propaganda and how that pervades us without us even knowing all the time until much later. I think that's the understanding today. It's happening to us all the time. And we're never really going to know. <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, it's not possible to answer the question now. Huh? So, um, <laughs> in, in the sense that, okay, so I'll say one or two things. Um, yeah, it's absolutely, I mean, we didn't get, the, the show doesn't go all the way, right? Like, I mean, if we were to think about it now um, on an international kind of scale, we would think about the Gulf also, right? We would think about the investment in, uh, in art by places like Abu Dhabi, for example. Uh, you know, and then, and then the Gulf labor would become important to think about what kind of protests, uh, you know. So basically, a group of artists were protesting the labor conditions of the uh, Guggenheim being built in Abu Dhabi, which has pretty much, it seems, kind of stalled the show. And, and the reason is not just that they were, I mean, my sense is, it's not just that people were protesting. Human Rights Watch was as well. They were working together with them. But it was also artists who they needed to write their history that were protesting. So you couldn't make that history that you wanted to claim, uh, you know, because someone like Waleed, this is my reading, huh? but this, uh, because if someone like Waleed Rad is not willing to give you the work that you need to write the history of modern Arab art. Uh, so they are, I think, the number of boycotts that are happening, uh, you know, and winning and not in big and small measures sometimes um, is, I think, where we would end up if we had to think about uh, where to look. But the, of course, it's not fully enough, and it's not an answer to the question of aesthetics. Uh, and it, it, again, depends where you're speaking from. And that's, I mean, the amount of practices that are so diverse from each other in the show is also maybe telling that, um, and you know, the case in Nigeria was really interesting, but I won't be able to get into it. Oops, I don't know what I did. Uh, get into it now, but, uh, oh, <laughs> do you wanna ask me? Uh, but, so the other answer to the question would, is that we're still, we're still in it. So we didn't make a full verdict in our show. We couldn't pass historical judgment Right? We, we wanted to open up the, what we were calling the conflict lines uh, to see how these things have, been play, have played out or how individual artists or individual contexts negotiated them. Uh, but it wasn't possible to pass a full judgment because we really think we are still in it. Right? Like the, the structures, I mean, the names of those organizations specifically might have receded, but those structures are completely uh, uh, in play, right? So, yes, please. Hi. Yeah. Um, I really, really enjoyed this Thank presentation. You. 
I didn't know the extent to like how big and extensive this um, exhibition was because I, you've got like so many artists and then also you're tracing back the different, the way the money actually moved, I think, in a sense. Not but, so much, but yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I don't really know, yeah. but from just yeah, yeah. this brief understanding yeah. of it. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you like about, you know, curating exhibitions and as a historian, yeah. how do you choose the sources and the artists that really make it to the end? And um, how do you like really, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's a, it's, it's a tough one in such a situation. We were four of us and we kind of stayed together on the same page till we were, I mean, what, I'm, what I mean by that is not that we necessarily agreed on everything, but uh, this show wasn't done like, okay, you deal with that part of the world and I'll deal with this part of the world and we'll come together and see what each of us want to do. We kind of, of course, at some point when the writing starts to happen, we split and, you know, I write what I may know better and Antonia will do the same or whatever. But, uh, but the decisions as to what to include uh, and how to go and how to conceive of exactly this interplay between archival material and artistic work uh, was something that we did together. This is not easy. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of money. And, and did you guys all read all of the sources? Oh, of course not. <laughs> but they were not, it's just not possible. Like, I mean, yeah. we, and then this is the thing, we had a period of, uh, you know, uh, the show happened six months before it was meant to happen. So, uh, but we still did have a good, you know, six, eight months of, uh, of working together. I wasn't there all the time at that time, so it wasn't like nonstop, but, um, and, and I think we really, in terms of uh, the question you're asking, so we're reading, we're reading a lot, we're talking a lot, and we're reading a really um, wide range, right? Uh, we're trying to understand, re-understand the last century, I'm not sure we did before, but you know, uh, but through this perspective. And as I was saying, we kept saying like, are we doing a show about these white bald spectacle men? Because that's what the CCF comprises of. And, so, and why an art show about, you know, um, about an organization? Uh, and, and that's, I think, the way, because we were interested in also art history, I mean, in, a, in the history of art somehow. Uh, and, and that's why, in a way, we even kept a lot of the CCF documentation somehow outside of the two exhibition halls. So, so that this interplay was even more pronounced. We weren't trying to kind of draw equal two signs, you know, between uh, this history and uh, its effects or something. And uh, in so far as choosing works, um, things came through sometimes, like in the case of uh, the dance piece, came through reading. But a lot of it also came through intuition, like a intuition. Like we didn't know the histories of each of these artists that were in the show before we chose them. Uh, but we were, we were looking at a lot, I guess. And that's what I was saying when the show at Tate, you know, Black Power Tate, uh, show at Tate happened, it was just uncanny for us because we had just begun to understand the works of, uh, you know, Romare Bearden and, um, Norman Lewis, who's also was super important for our show, uh, and others, uh, and you know they were. Um, so that sometimes things just come, you know. But yeah, I, I, maybe we talk more because it's hard to. Yeah. I mean, what came up for me really strongly was that, in effect, the CIA was a patron of the arts. Yeah. <clears throat> so that was kind of like, I mean, did that come out? I mean, and they were very excellent and effective patron, but what, what's interesting, I think that still carries through today. I mean, what does that mean for corporate patrons, institutional patrons, and how they're affecting and influencing art and artwork today? And, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, in this situation, you know, everybody has a particular reaction to, you know, CIA, political agendas, etc., etc. But I don't, I mean, corporate institutions and other institutions and also, um, capital and how it's directed is also very political and comes with its own ideologies, which still is what is controlling the art market. Yeah. Right? I mean, you could say the CIA saved modern art. Wow. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, this, this sort of dynamic, uh, so was this, I mean, was that dynamic sort of, um, sort of more explicit in that, the, 
in, through the exhibition, I mean, and that sort of questioning around what that dynamic is between, um, you know, patronage and the arts and... Okay, yeah, I mean, I, I don't... Um, as I'm saying, we weren't drawing a one-to-one -one relation. Of course, it is true that the CIA and MoMA, you know, um, yeah, but a, and especially when you see the range of, the CCF didn't necessarily produce a lot of artworks, let's say that. They did, this, did some very key shows, and that's where I think the question shifts a little bit uh, because of what's also at play in this story. It's not just the fact that, oh, um, the CIA is a patron of modern art, but the result of that patronage isn't just artworks that are produced or artists who create, because there is a separation. You know, um, besides Barnett, Newman, nobody's kind of in line with the, uh, with the agenda, right? Even though Jackson Park might be the poster boy, he's not, you know, um, he's doing what he's doing, right? And the, um, I think the reason why this is a very kind of still uh, a political concern we need to have with what it means for the CIA to have been um, a patron is that it's, it ends up becoming, sorry, a story of cultural hegemony, right? It's not, the, in 1952, so two years after, um, the CCF is founded. They did a huge, massive festival, not just an art festival, but a major, uh, also an art festival, um, called Masterpieces of the 20th Century. We're halfway through the century. They're deciding who the masterpieces are. What's in the show? It's most, besides maybe one, if not even, it's all European artists, mostly coming from American collections, right? So they're setting the stage to say, this is modern art, and now we're going to proceed from, I mean, it's also an inferiority complex uh, in, a vac in a moment. On one hand, there's a vacuum in Europe, and on the other hand, um, America doesn't have the Renaissance, right? So this is, a, this is a way in which you set the stage of what modern art has been by being the funders of bringing these shows. Like, I mean, to go back to Malevich, he, from the 30s to the late, uh, 50s, MoMA is the only public institution that has a Malevich work, right? So it's, it's, about, it's also about this, and then you kind of take over, and then when you start tracing how uh, Amer shows of American painters start moving, uh, that's the work that's being done. It's not the singular canvas that is being determined, like w what the stroke should be, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Just to push that point, it's a very important point, I think, uh, and probably put it more bluntly. Is, is there a difference when between? you come down? Is there a difference between the CIA funding art and the way art is funded today? The market, capital, etc. Because I, I get the fact of the mechanics of it, and the mechanics, you know, means yeah. a lot. I agree, that's the question. But I'm really asking at the level of hegemony. Say, say that again? So at the level of hegemony, yeah. is there no, a difference absolutely. at the end of the day, uh, do you think? And what might that be? <laughs> um, okay, so corporate funding and the CIA, right? Art market. Um, it's easy to say nothing, <laughs> and I wouldn't, you know, um, I, I would stand by it even. But I mean, the, the, and it's not to get a, you know, get away by saying the devil is in the details. But we need to understand what is happening and how it's happening, right? Well, I mean, this, our show didn't deal with this, but if we think of uh, art institutions in the third world that all happen to have uh, come up in the 90s, right? That's the funding that starts before the 
the market funding, it's the Ford Foundation funding, right? It's triangle out stress. I mean, why is, why do, uh, God, I shouldn't say it, but you know, I mean, it's not, not to say anything bad about these institutions at all, but the triangle out stress ends up starting places, being involved in places like Townhouse, Koj, um, there's Ashkal Alwan in um, Beirut, um, there, you know, there's all of Soros-funded, open society-funded art organizations in Eastern Europe uh, that all happened in the 90s, right? So it's not even, you know, also where the market begins and ends is, you know, is, a, is another question. But it is, it is crazy. Like, I mean, I wrote a small uh, text for one of these projects that was really trying to think about the contemporary and like where that, um, and what the 90s somehow, not only the 90s, but where that term emerges. And um, there was a workshop model that Triangles Out Stress started. And each situation where this workshop model was appropriated, local artists thought that this was their idea, that they were doing it because they wanted to. But it was a very fixed model that happened by chance with the founders of Triangle Out Trust, and then happened in situ in you know, various parts of the world. So you could trace the money to, to that too. But, and I mean, I think the question about the art market is also about a question of what happens to conceptual art. Right? How conceptual art goes from not being, from being against the object to entering the object, right? So uh, <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that 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 work said uh, it's a very funny work by Sigma Polka, a German artist who's responding actually to pop coming from America. But the title goes: Higher Beings Command. Paint the Higher Beings Command paint the left corner black. So <laughs> there were for us more uh, readings of this one. <laughs>